we'd like to welcome Dr. Richard Dupee. Dr. Dupee is a graduate of Tufts College and Tufts University School of Medicine and is a clinical professor of medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine and the chief of the geriatrics division at Tufts Medical Center. He teaches and mentors students and medical residents in the classroom and in the clinic at Tufts University Medical Center. He is also on the faculty of the Physician Assistant Program, providing geriatrics lectures and mentoring students in his office during their clinical rotations. Dr. Dupee is a former governor of the Massachusetts chapter of the American College of Physicians and currently president of the Massachusetts chapter of the American Geriatric Society where he has been instrumental in establishing national guidelines for geriatric education, both at the medical student and residency levels. He was recently honored as a master in the American College of Physicians. So welcome. Thank you, thank you. Hello everyone. So this afternoon we're gonna talk a, a bit about the dementias, uh, just to uh, set the record straight, uh, cause, uh, because this question comes up all the time, what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? And the answer is they're the same. So if we divide, divide the dementias down uh, to the various uh, types of dementia, Alzheimer's disease is probably about uh, two-thirds of all the uh, patients who have this uh, cognitive uh, disorder. And uh, there's, a, there's a, a good deal of uh, data to support that uh, many of the patients with Alzheimer's disease also have what we call vascular dementia. And that is vascular disease, such as, uh, such as you would see in coronary artery disease, for example, as playing a role in the dementing illness. Lewy body dementia now is probably number two, and we'll talk about what that is a, a little bit later, but that's a very unusual type of dementia. And then we have some of the other uh, dementias, frontotemporal dementia, which we call FTD, that's uh, usually manifest as socially inappropriate behavior. And then there's, there's a few others that are much more rare, Huntington's disease, uh, Parkinson's disease, where dementia happens much later in the course of the disease, and, and so on. So what I want to talk about a little bit as we uh, wait for some of the questions is, is what, what, what does this disease mean for us? Uh, let's think about uh, the prevalence, and that is that over the age of 65, uh, the presence of Alzheimer's disease and most of the other dementia, dementias is probably a little bit less than 10%, it's probably 6 to 8%, but then that increases dramatically as we get older. And one of the greatest risk factors for dementia is getting older. Now, mind you, uh, aging uh, does not cause Alzheimer's disease. It's just that as we get older, the risk increases. So that by the time you're 85, uh, you got a, well, almost a 50% chance of having uh, Alzheimer's disease or one of the other dementias. Uh, I think that uh, besides the, the financial uh, toll that this places on the United States and worldwide, so for example, direct costs and indirect costs in the United States uh, uh, last year were $600 billion. The problem is that only about 200, 250 billion was covered by Medicare and Medicaid, and that leaves families having to pay the difference. Worldwide, the uh, cost of caring for Alzheimer's patients and other patients with dementia is over 800 billion dollars, and it's going to get worse. So the, by the year, by uh, 2040, it's going to in this in this country, it's going to be over a trillion dollars, the, the direct and indirect costs. So we need to find a way to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's just caring for these folks is just going to be unaffordable. Uh, just to be clear as to, uh, we have our, our, our um, uh, understanding of what dementia is and, what, and how we really define Alzheimer's. So, first of all, as we discussed, dementia describes several of the disorders that we already talked about. But you, not only do you have to have memory loss, but it has to affect your function on a daily basis. So for example, uh, the Alzheimer's Association has a 10-point list of uh, how you would know um, the signs of Alzheimer's disease, starting with memory loss, but, but it has to interrupt with your daily life. So if I, I forgot my keys this morning, my car keys, and I couldn't find them, that's, that's not Alzheimer's disease, although I get asked that question a lot. And then over time, as, as you uh, face more challenges in solving problems, planning, um, uh, coordinating activities, and that becomes more and more of an issue, then you're starting to get into this list of, of the 10 uh, signs of Alzheimer's disease, which we'll talk about as we get into the questions. We're good? Yeah. So a question um, that we often receive, and 
while we're talking about different types of dementia, is if someone were to go to the doctor, what are some of the steps that the doctor might take to differentiate what type of dementia? Right. So if, if uh, it, generally speaking, families will come to my office and say, I'm, I'm worried about my dad. Uh, for the past year or so, he's been um, forgetting things. And last week, he got lost driving. And when he uh, finally realized where he was, he backed into a tree. Um, that sort of raises your concern as to whether or not there is something going on here. So what we will do in the office is we'll interview the patient who is having the cognitive loss and we'll perform the usual uh, history, physical examination, all the clinical things we do in medicine. And then we'll do a mental status evaluation. We can do it in a number of different ways, but uh, I prefer what's called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Exam. And the reason I do is because it's very sensitive in picking up early loss of cognition, which we call mild cognitive impairment. And uh, it's based upon the score more than anything else. And that allows me to uh, intervene a little bit earlier in terms of uh, um, making sure that family is aware that this is a problem, uh, understanding that there's a much higher risk for going on to developing Alzheimer's and the other dementias, and also even thinking about uh, interve uh, uh, medical intervention uh, through pharmaceuticals. So um, once we've done that, and we can determine that, that in a 30-point question, a patient only gets 20 correct, for example, that tells me that they're in the mild to moderate range of some sort of dementia. To determine what that is, we look at two different things. We look at family history. If there's a family history for Alzheimer's disease, that's probably what's going on. And then we look at all the risk factors. So if, if this dad is coming in with hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, perhaps already had a cardiac problem, there's certainly a component of vascular dementia here too. Do we care? To some extent, we do only because uh, patients with pure Alzheimer's versus vascular dementia uh, respond a little bit differently to medication. But we also care because if uh, we're then hearing that, the, that your dad is having delusions and, and hearing things, that's a completely different type of dementia, which we call Lewy body dementia. And there, the treatment is, is really very different than it is in the, with the other two. Yes, because Lewy body dementia, for example, uh, is a little bit, has a little bit more of a rapid pace, uh, whereas uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, a little bit slower pace. But the key to really, uh, and the Alzheimer's Association makes this very clear, the earlier you make this diagnosis, the better. Why? Because then while, uh, while your dad still has decision-making capacity and can still think things through, he can start to plan with his family and the family can plan for the future because this is a very stressful uh, disease, especially for family members and for the patients as well. And so if we can plan ahead and, uh, and make decisions while your dad is still uh, in pretty good shape, it'll make a huge difference in the long run. So what, what does it mean by going to the doctor early and getting an early diagnosis? At what point should a family consider going to see their doctor? Well, one of the things that I find is, uh, is I'll give you an example. So we have at Tufts uh, what we call a geri ortho service, geriatrics orthopedic service. And the reason we do that is because uh, the older population, when they come in with uh, a hip replacement or a knee replacement, postoperatively there's a, a pretty higher incidence of, of postoperative delirium, acute confusion, uh, which complicates the hospital course, uh, increases the length of stay, uh, and, and can have some bad outcomes. So we, inter we, we now screen patients, older patients, uh, before their orthopedic surgery with a mental status evaluation. We do a short memory test and we have them draw a clock. And if they don't do well in that, that tells me that there's a higher risk for postoperative delirium. So then we'll talk to the family and we'll say, were you aware that your uh, mom or dad was having a little problems with memory or uh, was having uh, problems with planning? And the, the vast majority of folks will say they'll sort of, um, yeah, sort of, but we didn't really want to think about it. And that's a mistake. If you see it, you need to report it to your physician because we need to get ahead of this at the very beginning. So what should someone do to prepare for this appointment? 
So if they're planning, they have the appointment ready, is there anything that they could bring with them, any questions they should prepare, any information they should have with them? I, I like to have all the family members present so I can get input from everyone. So for example, a husband and wife that have been married for 50 years or 60 years, um, main the and, and say it's the husband who's who's having some memory difficulties, his wife is generally going to be a little bit less um, willing to even accept this, and I understand that. Whereas the kids, they'll see it, and so I want to hear from everyone. So we'll all sit down and and hammer this out. Generally speaking, an, an older uh, a person who has this kind of cognitive dysfunction might be a little resistant to accepting the fact that it is a problem, especially with driving. But even with, with short-term memory deficit, but once we, once we do the evaluation and show them that there really is a problem here, they sort of catch on. So we often um, hear from families that sometimes it's hard to get their loved one to go see a doctor. Do you have any recommendations on conversations to have or any available resources to make that conversation between the family member and yeah, well, we've done it a number of different ways. Most most of the patients that get referred to me have already seen a primary care physician and are being treated for blood pressure or cholesterol, something like that. Um, and so if they're just coming to me as their primary care doctor and there's been a change, it's easy because they're coming for a different reason, and then we will discuss it. But if I'm getting a referral to make a diagnosis in someone who has loss of cognition, um, I've, I've had family members uh, really struggle to get their mom and dad to accept that it's a problem and then go see a specialist about it. So it's a real problem. And I think the best way to get around this is to get as many family members involved as possible. Even after a motor vehicle accident or getting lost, there's a lot of resistance to wanting to accept that I've got a problem. Uh, and again, the only way to make this happen is to, is, to, is to raise the level of consciousness of everyone, especially the family members, and get them to bring their dad in. That makes a lot of sense. So you already touched on some of the assessments that someone might expect in terms of just basic looking at their history um, and some of the cognitive testing. What are some other assessments that someone might expect? Well, besides uh, the cognitive assessment, because that's really the key, because if you, if you can't remember two out of five objects in five minutes, we've got a problem. If you can't uh, completely draw a clock, put the numbers in and have the clock say, for example, 440, meaning uh, you've got to do a four and an eight, uh, shorthand, longhand, uh, which, which uh, tells, if you're able to do that, it tells me you actually can extract information Verb, uh, um, get it to the frontal lobe where there's planning and, and, and understand that that 8x represents 440. But if, people, if the folks have a hard time with the, clock, with the clock drawing, especially in that fourth quadrant between 9 and 12, then we know that there's significant cognitive deficits here, uh, significant uh, frontal lobe primarily issues uh, that are going to requ require uh, investigation. But then, uh, once we know we have a cognitive problem, the question is, what is it? And why did it happen? And so we want to look at blood pressure control over the years, especially in the middle age uh, area, because that's where the highest risk is. Cholesterol levels, LDL cholesterol levels, um, uh, whether or not there's diabetes, um, and whether or not there's any other evidence for vascular disease, especially smoking, uh, those kinds of things. So. Um, we'll look at all of those uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, areas as well as um, making sure that we've done the mental status evaluation. Are there reversible causes of dementia type symptoms? So while you're doing that workup, may, may there be things that can be treated? Right. They're rare, unfortunately. B12 deficiency is probably the most common, um, it's, but it's rare. I, ha I do have a patient um, many, many years ago uh, who was referred to me uh, when I was in private practice, and she um, was losing things, not leaving the house, leaving the stove on, uh, really having difficulty. She completely failed her mental status evaluation, so I did the usual, well, let's do the B12 level and the thyroid level and all those other things, and she had literally no B12. And yet she didn't have pernicious anemia, and she didn't have neuropathy. It was just an amazing story. We put her on B12, and she's perfectly fine now. But that's so rare, it's unfortunate. There are other reversible causes, however, uh, one of which would be uh, uh, HIV. 
So, for example, uh, HIV dementia is more common in the older male population for a number of different reasons. But once the, H once the patient is treated, the uh, cognitive dysfunction improves. Uh, that's also very rare. So going back to the assessments, are neuroimaging techniques like MRI or PET imaging ever used as part of the diagnosis process? Well, sometimes when, when we're a little bit confused as to the what is actually going on here, so I'll see a patient who's a little slow to answer all the questions, uh, seems a little bit depressed. We'll do a depression scale, and they, you know, then depression, depression scales are not all that sensitive. And I'm just not sure, is this what we call pseudo-dementia, where the patient is just depressed versus true dementia? And we have ways to figure that out. Once we've gotten beyond that, uh, families will say, well, I want, to, I want my dad to have a PET scan. And I will try to get, get uh, families to understand that it's not going to change the diagnosis and it's not going to change the treatment. But if I'm a little bit not clear as to w exactly what type of dementia we're dealing with here, I will do a PET scan. The American Academy of Neurology in the workup in patients who have loss of memory does ask that uh, we do a one-time head CT. Uh, brain scan, just a CT, not an MRI. And the only reason to do that is to be sure that there's not a brain, a brain tumor, and uh, that would be so rare as a cause of dementia, but we do it anyway. As we're talking about some of these tests, um, we know that the research is starting to show using biological markers of the disease that sometimes the brain changes occur before the onset of symptoms. Yes. Are there any assessments to show whether someone's developing Alzheimer's disease or another type of before they actually have symptoms? Well, you know, if you are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, you've had brain changes for 20 years. So what are the markers? Um, there's a number of different things we could do. First of all, just to make it clear, the genetics, uh, uh, a, a patient who has Alzheimer's from a genetic standpoint are very, very rare. But there are some genetic uh, markers, which we call alleles, uh, which we can actually test for. Uh, and um, patients who have what's, what's basically called what we call 4-4 have a higher risk, although there's plenty of patients who don't. So the problem with doing the, the testing is that it's, uh, it'll raise a lot of concern and worry in someone who may never get Alzheimer's disease, and therefore we don't recommend that, that it's done. There are other things we can do as well. Primarily these are more uh, research-oriented, but we can do a lumbar puncture and take spinal fluid out and check for tau protein, which is one of the theoretical causes of Alzheimer's disease. And you, you can find tau protein in uh, patients uh, who ultimately have developed Alzheimer's 10 years prior to that. But again, this is all research uh, related and we're, we're not recommending these test this testing be done. While we're on that topic, um, you've talked a lot about vascular dementia and cardiovascular risk factors. Can you talk more about the relationship Sure. If you think about, if you think about um, how do you avoid having a heart attack, uh, and uh, this is about three quarters of, of what, what we have here at the Alzheimer's Association is 10 ways, to, 10 ways to love your brain. In other words, basically reduce your risk. Now, I, 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 there's a caveat here, in that, and that is that unfortunately we don't have data that tells us that if you do all these things, uh, you will not get vascular dementia or Alzheimer's disease. But we do think that there's a, um, a good deal of data to support that if you do these things, you reduce your risk. So what are they? Reduce your cardiovascular risk factors. Control your blood pressure, especially in midlife. Control your LDL cholesterol, get it below 100. Um, some people will say 130, but and certainly if you're a diabetic, below 90. Um, Make sure that your diet is balanced. We think the Mediterranean diet is probably uh, makes the most sense, but one thing's for sure, it should be a diet that is low in fat and to some extent now even low in carbohydrate, which doesn't give you a lot of room. Um, and so it has to be kind of balanced. Um, we think that uh, five to six hours of sleep at night is probably not going to work. Uh, I, I remember a patient I had who was a, a former professor actually who uh, lived on three hours of sleep almost his entire life, and he got Alzheimer's disease at a very young age. Um, there is a relationship between depression and Alzheimer's, and so uh, if there is a history for you have a depression, it needs to be treated with, uh, with either uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and or medication. Don't smoke. Uh, I think that's clear. Smoking increases your risk not only for cardiovascular disease, but smokers have a higher risk for uh, cognitive loss. 
There's a lot of support that uh, those who have had a formal education and more advanced degrees have less risk for developing dementia. Uh, one thing's for sure, w once we make our diagnosis at an early stage, we really push to have, uh, have you challenged uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, constantly uh, challenging yourself by reading the newspaper, taking, uh, doing crossword puzzles, those kinds of things. Exercise is critical. We we certainly feel that way uh, in terms of cardiovascular disease, for that matter, in cancers. And um, what's what's a reasonable amount of exercise? I think that what I generally advise my patients, especially as they're getting a little older, should be 150 minutes of moderate exercise a day, uh, a week, and that's simply going out and taking a walk for for 45 minutes, maybe three or four times a week. Uh, but again, uh, mind challenging is critical. The other issue is uh, social engagement. There is some data that uh, suggests that, uh, and especially in certain Japanese islands off the coast of Japan and in other areas, that people who are socially engaged in a small community and constantly involved have less risk. So those are, are, are really um, basically the 10 ways to what we call love your brain, but 10 ways to probably at least reduce your risk for developing dementia. Yeah. Can you talk more about the link between diabetes and cognitive decline? Yeah, I think that um, the connection is not complete. Uh, there's no question that diabetics have a higher risk for, for vascular disease. Um, but it's not clear that diabetics actually have a, a greater risk for developing a dementia. Nonetheless, it is a risk factor. And therefore, controlling the, the uh, blood sugar is, is critical. Now, there's a lot of uh, difference of opinion regarding what, uh, for those of you who are diabetic, uh, should shoot for for your A1C. So the VA study says nine, the ACP says seven, and the um, American Society of Endocrinology wants you down in, at six. I don't think anybody can agree on this, but I think lower is better. And, um, and at least, I can't say you'd I could guarantee that you're not going to get Alzheimer's by lowering your a A1C, but it's another one of the list of areas where you need to intervene to try to keep yourself healthy and out of trouble. Sure, sure. So there's an interesting dementia called uh, FTD, frontotemporal dementia, and, and a subset of it is what we call primary progressive aphasia. So the frontotemporal dementia patients will present uh, less with um, uh, memory loss and more with sort of inappropriate social behavior. And uh, it gets to the point where the, uh, it, that the husband or wife will bring the patient in uh, with, with a worry that there's something else going on. And then we do the test and we discover there's also a significant cognitive dysfunction, memory loss, uh, 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 um, problems with planning, which we call executive function. <clears throat> and these, and these uh, folks are really tough to treat because the, there really isn't much in the way of medication to control this behavior. And unfortunately, a lot of these people end up on antipsychotics, which themselves have side effects. So it's, a, it's really a, it's, it's a tough disease to, to manage, but we do. Uh, and we do use uh, the same, some of the medications that we use in Alzheimer's disease, uh, as well as in vascular dementia. The primary progressive aphasia uh, patients have more difficulty uh, sort of getting the word out. There's a disconnect between what's in the brain and what they, and, and they can actually uh, spit out that word, and yet they completely understand what you're saying. So it's very frustrating uh, uh, kind of a uh, form of dementia. There's also a, a primary progressive dementia that is, that is also associated with memory uh, deficits as well. Uh, so they come in, in kind of two different forms. There's also treatment for this, but again, we'll talk about treatment later. The treatment is not, um, unfortunately, hardly a cure. Sure. So the brain functions uh, in a number of different ways. There's the chemical root, and that would, that's uh, basically what we call the cholinergic system. And it's interesting how we discovered that. And that is that uh, in patients who had sort of memory deficit would get a cold, for example, and go out and take an over-the-counter cold medication, which had uh, Benadryl, diphenhydramine, 
and they got considerably worse, very confused uh, to the point of, of, of almost becoming delirious. So that's, I think, where uh, research started ahead to understand that the cholinergic system is so important in our ability to uh, basically um, learn as, as well as remember. And that's, that's what led to the development of what we call cholinesterase inhibitor therapy. The first one that came out was Dinepazil, which is, which is Aricept, and there's been a bunch since then. And so what do we know about that one? That, when that research was done tw a little over 20 years ago and we started using these medications, what we, what we discovered was what was originally discovered by Pierre Terrio and his, and his uh, colleagues when this medication first, uh, first uh, was uh, tested in, uh, in phase three and four studies, and that was it slowed the pace of the disease, such that the time to, from the time of diagnosis to the time of so, such loss of function that the patient en ends up total care was delayed by eight to 10 years. So then we add uh, another medication uh, it, through another um, uh, circuit that helps you to remember, and that is uh, the glutamate system. The glutamate system um, is responsible primarily for uh, more learning as, as opposed to remembering. So we're constantly learning as we speak. It's a very highly active system which is also defective in Alzheimer's disease. And so if we, can, if we can boost that a little bit, maybe we can not turn this thing around, but maybe we can again slow the pace. And so we've been able to do so with a drug called Memantine, which is Nemenda, uh, which was originally a twice a day drug, and now we have it as a once a day drug. Uh, and um, it, it, over a period of four to six weeks, we go from the seven milligram a day all the way up to the 28 milligram. And now you can even get the memantine and uh, Dinepazil in the same pill. Do I use these? Absolutely. Why? Because, it's, because these drugs do slow down the time that your mom and dad goes from um, being, at, uh, being home to a nursing home. We get an extra five, six, seven years, maybe longer at home. Uh, and, a, and an improved quality of life before transfer either to a nursing home or requiring 24 and seven hour care. So to um, jump off of that point a little bit more in terms of how the current medications do help with the cognitive symptoms a little bit, um, we often hear about these symptom modifying drugs and the disease modifying drugs. Can you talk a little bit about the difference? Well, the symptom modify, well, the, the symptom modifying drugs would be primarily the functional uh, side of things. These two drugs that I mentioned, they will um, allow you to maintain function. I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Memantine, when that first came on the market, uh, there was a lot of trepidation about whether or not this drug would work. But I remember my very first patient that I put on it, and I, and I had read that this actually might happen. My patient uh, had, an, had what we call apraxia, inability to understand what to do with a phone when it rang. So the family would tell me the phone would ring and my dad, he would just look at it. We put him on Memantine and after the six week on Memantine, the phone rang, he picked it up and got on the phone. So certainly modified the, the disorder, if that's what you want to call it, and uh, also improved his function as well as his quality of life. So I'm not sure that we really modify the disease as much as we do uh, the sort of the side effects of the disease. Right now, um, it's almost impossible to modify the disease with any oral medication, but there's certainly a lot of uh, work being done now on vaccinations designed to clear the brain of what theoretically is the cause of the disease, and that's the, the, these basically nasty proteins that sit in the brain, um, amyloid and tau. And if we can clear them out, there's data to support that patients' memory gets better Function gets back to baseline, and they do, and they and they do significantly better. We're really early in on this. Uh, we don't have enough data to su to support uh, even uh, even suggesting that in five years we're going to have this thing all turned around. I hope that's true, but uh, certainly there's a lot of data that's pretty exciting that's telling us that at least with these nasty proteins, if we can get them out of the brain, we can mo modify the disease basically. It's really exciting. To Right. So taking a step back a little bit, since we're talking about some of the assessments and the different types of dementia, if someone were to receive a diagnosis, what would be the next steps in their care? 
Right. So that kind of brings up the question as to where do you go to get the make the diagnosis. So the usual course of events is the primary care doctor is told by family members that there's something wrong with my dad. It's very, very rare that the primary care doctor will actually make the diagnosis in someone that uh, he or she has been caring for for 20 years. And the reason for that is it's, you know, the, there's a lot of stress in medicine right now. It's, a 50, it's the usual 15-minute office visit. Focus on the blood pressure, focus on the diabetes and the cholesterol, and let's move on. So it's pretty rare that that diagnosis is going to be made one-on-one, -on -one, but it certainly is going to be made when family members come in and say, I'm worried about my dad for all the reasons that we talked about earlier. So the primary care doctor has a couple of different options. If he or she is interested in the disease, uh, then we'll perform the, the MOCA or the MMSE or one of the other mental status evaluations and actually treat the patient and follow them on a regular basis. That's rare. Um, most of the time, the primary care doc will send the, uh, the dad to a neurologist. That's generally speaking what happens. The, but the neurologist uh, will certainly do all the appropriate testing, make a diagnosis, and tell the family members this is what you got, uh, and then go back to the primary care doc. The primary care docs don't have a lot of experience with these medications, let alone uh, longitudinal care of these folks. And that's where the geriatricians come in. Uh, we in geriatrics, this is what we do. Uh, we make the diagnosis and we treat these patients longitudinally. The problem is there aren't a whole lot of geriatricians around. I'm, in a, I'm a rare breed. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's, that's the case because we're talking about, fi what, almost 50% of people over the age 85 have Alzheimer's? So who is taking care of them? And how many of them are actually on the medications? Um, raises a whole lot of questions. I don't have an answer to this. Uh, I encourage my residents at Tufts to understand the disease, understand the medications, and to take on the responsibility if they go into primary care or, or even any subspecialty. And I think that more and more they're recognizing that is, that is going to be their role. So you talked about this follow-up in the longitudinal care. Can you talk a little bit more about the disease progression? With the caveat that we know it's a little different for everyone. Sure. The average Alzheimer patient uh, from the time of diagnosis, and mind you, by the time the diagnosis has been made, it's been going on for at least a year and maybe even two, uh, and not been obvious to a lot of people, including the patient themselves, or the patient recognizes it and just does not want to uh, accept it. So at any rate, uh, we, th we used to think that maybe 20 years ago, it had a ten the, the lifespan was about 10 years. Now it's a lot longer, and the reason it's a lot longer is because we're, we're much better prepared to care for these folks, uh, again, using the medications that I uh, mentioned, uh, getting, uh, getting uh, family support, getting family educated, uh, involving uh, uh, folks with the uh, Alzheimer's Association so that they can sort of uh, really understand the disease and uh, begin to accept it and understand the various approaches that need to be taken. Uh, and, and again, I think the medications played a big role here, but the average time from diagnosis to death is now about 15 years. So we haven't talked about it yet, but we often hear the term mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. Can you talk a little bit more about that stage of the disease? Right. So there's, uh, there's a little bit of a disconnect uh, in, in terms of where these folks with MCI go. Mild cognitive impairment uh, is best tested uh, with, with the Montreal Cognitive Assessment exam because it's most sensitive. And what you'll get is in the, in the list of questions, you might have difficulty, um, not with a clock. If you have difficulty with a clock, you, you've got worse than mild cognitive impairment. You might remember four out of five objects at five minutes, for example. Um, you might have a little bit of difficulty uh, with... with um, maybe telling me how many words begin with F in, in, uh, in 60 seconds, you know, trying to draw down what those might be. And so your normal score is 30, maybe your score is 26. Um, and again, if the clock is normal, you probably have what's called mild cognitive impairment. But that test isn't everything. You have to, we have to get information from family members as well. So the family members, um, the usual story I get is, you know what? He's asked me the same question three times over a period of two days. And I've given him an answer, and he forgets. 
So I do two things. One, make sure the hearing is adequate. And two, if I realize that, then, then we do the MOCA. And we put it all together and say, this patient's got mild cognitive impairment. What do we do with that? There is some data to suggest that uh, those with mild cognitive impairment actually, some percentage, will actually get better and never develop a dementia, probably had some sort of stress or some associated depression. Majority um, will go on to develop uh, uh, some form of dementia probably within the next three or four years. The FDA has not approved any of these medications for mild cognitive impairment. I kind of agree with that. Um, I'm hoping that um, over time, what we're going to see is in someone who's got true mild cognitive impairment at 26, 27, and we're not really sure what's going on, uh, those folks actually may go on to, develop, to have a pet, to just get a sense for uh, what the uh, protein burden is. The problem with the pet is we could all have amyloid plaques and never get dementia. So it's really, uh, it, 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 the science is not exact, that's for sure. Sure. So if you have a, a mom or dad who has Alzheimer and developed it probably in their 70s, 80s, something like that, what, is your, what are the chances that you're going to get it? There's no question you have an increased risk uh, because it, there are some genetics involved here, although genetic Alzheimer's itself is only about 2% of the total. So it's rare. That means you've got a good chance that you won't get it. Uh, however, I think that uh, certainly in my field and in, in the number of years that I've been in practice, I've seen it, uh, and certainly when I have a patient who presents with what appears to be cognitive deficits and their mom or dad had Alzheimer's, that's probably uh, going to be the case here as well. Now we're at mild cognitive impairment, with, uh, as we just discussed, and the question is, what is our intervention? Unfortunately, we don't have a lot. Um, so I think that again, your chance, uh, your chances are greater than uh, are greater than not that you will not have Alzheimer's as, with a parent who has it because it's such a rare form. And while we're on that subject, um, we often hear of young onset Alzheimer's disease versus late onset. Can you talk about the differences a little bit? Sure. Remember the first case of Alzheimer's, Lois Alzheimer. That was a, a woman in her in her thirties or forties, as I recall, and um, and. and that's so rare. I've never seen it other than my B12 deficiency patient. So um, I've never seen it at that age, but that is kind of interesting. The, the, um, it, the, the average age is probably over the, it's over 65, um, sometimes 60s, but it's pretty much over 65. The FTD probably a little younger, maybe in the 50s, frontal temporal dementias. Majority of patients, um, if you look at the stats, I guess it makes sense. You got a doubling uh, every every five years after the age of sixty five, and you have forty five percent at age eighty five. So one thing's for sure: age is so age increases your risk. There's no question. Um, but I think that um, it'd be pretty rare. And and again, I've been uh, doing this for many years. I've never seen uh, anyone under the age of fifty have any kind of uh, dementing illness. No, the assessment would be exactly the same. I think first, obviously, if it's a younger person, I'd be worried about frontotemporal. I'd also uh, worry a little bit about uh, um, Lewy body because that can start in the you know 55, 60, and again we think it's due to some crazy virion uh, that uh, causes protein uh, de deposits in the in the brain. Not that it, you can catch it. Uh, we, we just don't know how it gets there. So, um, but again, the workup would be the same. We need to diagnose what the extent of the cognitive loss is, how it affects function and daily routine, and then, and then go from there. What about differences in care planning and treatment and management of disease? Biggest problem I have is getting support for the patient. I think if we have, um, uh, let's say, a, uh, a widow who's been living alone and his daughter's in California, that's a real problem. So we, getting family involved is absolutely critical. 
uh, but just so the audience knows, roughly um, almost 50%, but probably somewhere between 40 and 50% of primary caregivers, and that is the daughter or son who's, who's actually taken on the responsibility uh, for caring for their mom and dad, have an increased risk for depression, increased risk for suicide for that matter, more health problems, and about half of these folks actually end up quitting their job in order to take care of their mom or dad. So now it comes down to finances because caring for a mom and dad at home with a dementia is not covered by Medicare. Uh, and it's not covered by Medicaid. Uh, and that's why uh, of the $600 billion spent a year in caring for these poor folks, uh, Medicare, Medicaid only, uh, only counts for a uh, little over 200. You're looking at $400 billion that has to come out of the pockets of the families to try to take care of their mom or dad. It's a real problem. So we organize the family. We get as many people in as we can. We certainly get uh, the Alzheimer's Association, in our, in our case, the Mass Alzheimer's Association, because they can help to coordinate and, get, and, get, uh, and give you ideas as to how you can get help at home. The problem is it costs money. Not calling you Mass Alzheimer's, by the way. Yes, I, I take care of a lot of caregivers. And each time they come in, I had uh, a husband was in yesterday in my office with his wife, uh, who, uh, and they're, they're in their uh, mid-70s. And I diagnosed her with primary progressive aphasia a couple years ago. And he's really, he's really exhausted. Uh, he um, finds it difficult not to try to correct her. And, I'm, and I would advise you as the, as the caregivers, uh, if if there is some sort of behavior that uh, is frustrating for you, I feel your pain, but don't don't take it out on on the on the mom or dad because it is, it, things will just get worse. If you're finding as as he is, he's stressed. I sat him down and I said, "You are really stressed, aren't you?" And he just broke down. And so what I've done is I've arranged. And now they can afford this uh, to get 24 hours a week of help at home so that he can get out and do his things. Uh, he's already taken on the responsibility for doing all the cooking and he's fine with that. But he's so stuck to watching his wife because he's afraid she's gonna leave the stove on, which she's done several times, they have a gas stove, or that she's gonna run out the uh, front door out, out on, on, onto the street. So getting help is really critical. Unfortunately, it, it is costly um, and they don't have kids around. Their kids are in California. So this, fortunately, this worked out well for them. But uh, it doesn't work that way for everybody, I'm afraid to say. And while we're talking about caregivers, um, I just want to make sure that the audience is aware of our 24-7 helpline. It's written on the board behind Dr. Dupi. And if you have any other questions at the end of this webinar or anything comes up, please don't hesitate to reach out to the helpline. Right. Um, while we're on the topic of resources, are there other um, opportunities and resources that you often recommend? For In terms of resources, yeah. the first thing the first thing I do when I make the diagnosis, and I and we we do it after over a period of a couple of weeks, and I get all the family members in, and we sit down, and I give them the news, and the uh, first thing we do is connect them to Mass Alzheimer's, because they're going to get a lot of information uh, that will help them to understand what the disease is all about, the disease progression, and so on and so forth. Now, I, I make the time to, to basically review all these things with, with family members, but a lot of doctors don't have the time to do this. And so um, I am certainly try to get all the primary care docs to say, look, um, I know you have a lot of questions. Um, this, is, uh, this is going to be a burdensome problem. Uh, for you. Uh, you're going to have a lot of questions. So let's connect you with Mass Alzheimer's. So they'll either call the helpline, we'll give them information uh, in the office about what they, uh, about the disease itself, and try to educate. Because once family members are educated, it's a whole lot easier to deal with this, with this condition. Yeah, the education is definitely key. Right. And on that topic, we often hear families who are interested in getting involved in clinical trials or clinical studies. Do you have any recommendations on that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, at our at our hospital, we've got several cl uh, clinical trials going on. Um, I think we have a. Is it in here? It's right in here. Yeah. So um, yes, there's no question that enrolling cl clinical trials is key. Why? 
because for one, you may be in the treatment arm as opposed to the placebo arm and your mom and dad might actually get better. Uh, and two, uh, I think we have that responsibility to, uh, to try to uh, reduce the uh, tremendous increase in Alzheimer's that, and other dementias that we're going to see in the next uh, 20, 30 years, 40 years, uh, to try to have an impact on all this. The more we can do to uh, find a way to prevent this disease, obviously the better. If you think about um, uh, smallpox, for example, which, which uh, took the lives of millions of people, and then we, in, in essence, eradicated the disease through a, vac a simple vaccination. Um, we're hoping a simple vaccination is going to do the same thing in Alzheimer, uh, but there's no way we're going to figure this out if we don't have volunteers who enroll in these, in these studies. The Alzheimer's Association also has Trial Match, which is a clinical studies matching tool. It's confidential. You can access it online or by phone, and it will match you with studies that you may be qualified for that you can then um, learn more about the study and reach out to the study site to get involved. Great. So I think we got to all of the questions. Are there any last comments or anything that we didn't touch upon? That you'd like to no, I think we've covered it. I think that, um, I, believe me, I, for those of you who are going through this, I, I do feel your pain. I've been uh, um, caring for patients and families uh, who have had to go through this with all the various dimensions for many, many years. And I know how difficult it, and, and, and uh, it really can be very, very difficult. You're going to be faced uh, with the decision at some point, if you're lucky enough to be able to keep your mom and dad at home, uh, you're going to be faced with the need at some point as the disease progresses and, and, and the patient then starts to develop delusions, hallucinations, acting out behavior, um, exit seeking, trying to go out the front door, running around all night uh, and sleeping during the day, all, all those kinds of things, uh, unfortunately, you're going to be faced with. So at some point, uh, you'll have to make a decision about whether or not it's appropriate to begin what we call atypical antipsychotics. Uh, that's the Seroquels and the Haldols of the world. I, I would be very cautious in using them. So my advice to you is this. If you have a, uh, if you have a family member that has the disease and starts to have a, what we call a change in condition, um, acting out behavior, um, staying up all night, trying to go out the door, um, something new. The first thing you do is bring your mom and dad to the doctor and make sure there's no infection present because that's the usual cause. If there's no infection present and there's nothing else going on, it's not unusual, for example, to, uh, I've seen this happen to someone who has heart failure. And we treat the heart failure and all these symptoms go away, but for the dementia. So it's important to get to your doctor right away and make sure that there's nothing else going on. Once that happens and it's, you, your mom and dad has been shown not to have anything uh, reversible going on, you're going to probably be faced with using these medications. Um, I'm not opposed to them because they can certainly calm things down and make life a little bit better for all of you. Uh, but they have their limitations and they certainly have a lot of side effects. So if you make the, de if you make the decision to use these medications, it should be thought out uh, very carefully with a lot of input from your physician. Right. So, right. So, uh, just so everybody understands what delirium is all about, we see it in the hospital after surgery, in in an older patient who has a dementia. And as I think as I, I mentioned before, when, once we've made the diagnosis, I go back to family members and I say, "Did you notice that your mom and dad was having some difficulty remembering?" And they say, "Yeah, I guess I, I guess I did." And uh, that's why we try to pick these people up preoperatively because at, at our hospital, we'll, our, my geriatrics team will, will pick these folks up in the, in the PACU right after surgery and, and, uh, and co-manage with, with the orthopedics team to prevent the, the development of delirium. Why does delirium happen? Usually it's a patient with, with dementia who postoperatively has either an infection, uh, uh, too much medication, too much pain, Urinary retention, constipation, there's a whole bunch of reasons for it. It's primarily infection. 
uh, but they are off the wall and uh, either agitated or more commonly what we call hypoactive delirium, which is actually the most common type, where they just lie in bed and they don't do anything. And so we think maybe they're over, over sedated from too much uh, pain medication, um, but um, more often than not, that's, that's what we call delirium. You can't get, you can't get the patient's attention. It waxes and wanes, uh, and it has a very high risk for um, mortality. So we immediately go after the patient, try to uh, uh, find the cause for it, and treat the cause that we don't have to use these medications. Many, many years ago, these folks just got Haldol, ended up in the intensive care unit, had a very high risk for dying, but all that has changed now because people recognize that delirium is basically an acute medical emergency. If it happens at home, like I said before, the first thing you do is get, this, get your mom and dad to the doctor. Um, the delirium can present in a number of different ways, but it primarily will present as either agitation, pacing, or not wanting to get out of bed um, it, with no other reason for that and no ch recent change in medication. When you see that happening, get your mom and dad to the doc. I think that that's a really strong message throughout this whole um, webinar is if you're not sure, if you have questions, if you're concerned about your own memory or um, cognitive impairment, for a loved one, go see the doctor. Um, the Alzheimer's Association is here for you. We have lots of resources on our website. We have a 24 hour a day, seven day a week helpline that you can call and always talk to a live person with any types of questions. And so there are a lot of resources out there. This is a tough disease. So please, please don't hesitate to reach out. This was very informative and we really appreciate your time and this was really great. Happy to do so. Much.